People in Japan are observing the fourth anniversary of the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The disaster devastated the country's northeast and triggered a meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. A magnitude 9.0 earthquake unleashed waves more than 10 meters high. The tsunami caused extensive damage along the Pacific coast. Nearly 18,500 people were killed or went missing. At least 3,200 others have died because of indirect effects such as illness or stress while living as evacuees. About 230,000 people were still living in temporary housing as of February. The government plans to build about 30,000 public housing units, but only 19 percent have been completed so far. Dismantling the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant is one of Japan's biggest burdens. Workers with operator Tokyo Electric Power Company are struggling to deal with a buildup of radioactive water at the complex. TEPCO executives plan to clean up the tainted water by the end of March, but they say they won't be able to keep to the schedule. Authorities estimate it'll take up to 40 years to decommission the plant. There are concerns about possible delays. The most difficult task will be removing the melted nuclear fuel. The central and local governments plan to complete the decontamination work for mainly residential areas by March 2017. But the survivors fear public interest in the issue will decrease over time. The accident in Fukushima is just one of the legacies of the March 2011 disaster. People in Japan will mark the anniversary of the earthquake and tsunami this Wednesday. More than 15,000 people died and about 2,600 others are still listed as missing. Fukushima Daiichi suffered three meltdowns, and it was hit by three hydrogen explosions. Radioactive contamination forced tens of thousands of people to leave their homes. Evacuation orders are still in effect for large areas. Work is underway to decommission the plant. But experts say the process will take 30 to 40 years. The operator of the facility has made some progress, but it continues to face setbacks. NHK World's Noriko Okada reports. You could say we've made a big step toward decommissioning the reactors. But we have to be even more careful as the work progresses. In December, work was completed to remove spent fuel from the number four reactor building. The material needs to be cooled continuously in order to remain safe. This is being done in a separate building since the number four building was damaged by hydrogen explosions. The next step will be to remove fuel from the buildings where reactors suffered core meltdowns. An even more challenging task is removing molten fuel. It is believed to have dried and hardened. Researchers are still trying to find a way to remove it. This is a huge challenge. We have to combine techniques in ways that we have never tested before. Some combinations will work, but in other cases, we will have to make fundamental adjustments. The decommissioning process is already behind schedule. Problems involving radioactive water were the biggest cause of delays. Last month, TEPCO executives announced that contaminated rainwater has leaked into the Pacific Ocean. They admitted that they knew about the situation as early as last April. TEPCO's response infuriated local fishermen. We are truly very sorry for the worry and trouble we've caused the fishing industry. Why didn't you tell us honestly about what was going on when you knew about it since last year? We can't trust you anymore. Another problem is groundwater that mixes with highly radioactive water that is injected inside the crippled reactor containers. Every day, about 300 tons of contaminated water accumulates at the facility. TEPCO has set up nearly 1,000 storage tanks. But once they fill up, there will be little space to add more. Contaminated water isn't the only issue. Heaps of black bags sit on the side of roads. They hold radioactive soil and other waste collected during decontamination work. The piles of waste have slowed down the entire rebuilding effort. 
Leaders in Fukushima allowed the central government to begin building their storage facilities. Officials in Tokyo hope they will start receiving shipments of waste this month. All told, the government plans to build intermediate storage sites over 16 square kilometers. But so far, it has received permission to use only the two sites. Their small size means they will be able to hold only one-tenth of one percent of the accumulated waste. Government officials have been negotiating with over 2,000 landowners in a bid to buy more land. As of now, none of them have agreed to sell. Noriko Okada, NHK World. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has reiterated his commitment to rebuilding northeastern Japan. People in the area are still trying to recover from the powerful earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear accident. Abe spoke on the eve of the fourth anniversary of the disaster. We will mark the fourth anniversary of the earthquake tomorrow. I would like to express my heartfelt condolences for the people who lost their lives in the disaster. Abe said the government will draw up a new few, or new five-year plan rather for a reconstruction. It will be implemented next April. The intensive reconstruction period ends in March next year. We will create a new framework to help rehabilitation by this summer. The members of my cabinet share the view that each one of us is responsible for reconstruction. I have just ordered my ministers to unite their efforts to create a plan based on that spirit. The government will continue to do all it can to support reconstruction efforts, so each and every person in the affected area can look forward to a bright future. We will help revitalize local industry and the economy. We want to make the area a center of advanced technologies and industries, such as robotics and renewable energy. We will help people who have been affected by the Fukushima nuclear accident. We will expand our aid so they can restart their lives and their businesses. We intend to compile a set of measures in a few months to revitalize Fukushima. And we will show you our vision of how we want Fukushima to be in the future. The accident at Fukushima Daiichi poses another challenge. Abe said the government will lead efforts to ensure safe, long-term storage of nuclear waste. We should not pass the burden of nuclear waste onto future generations. The government will take the initiative in finding ways to store nuclear waste. We might review our plan and propose a new scheme based on the latest scientific data. More than 18,000 people died or went missing in the quake and tsunami. Over 3,000 have died because of indirect effects such as illness or stress while living as evacuees. Earlier, our senior political commentator, Masaya Nakajima, and join me in the studio to share his insight on Abba's news conference. Masayo, it looks like Abe is really serious about revitalizing northeastern Japan. That's right. Abe revealed a plan that will relieve the, the anxiety of local governments and residents. He said that government will create a new framework for five more years of reconstruction. The government had initially designated the first five years after the disaster as a period of intensive reconstruction. But that time ends next year, and there's still a lot to be done. Local government officials and residents are worried about what happens next. And they expected the government to re-examine how to proceed with reconstruction beyond the first five years. Abe said that new plan starts in fiscal 2016. Prime Minister Abe has also faced uh, with the challenge of dealing with managing nuclear waste. That's right. Abe said that the Japan has a certain amount of highly radioactive waste already. He said it is the government's responsibility to take the lead in finding a permanent disposal site for contaminated waste. 
He said the government will propose、uh, possible places for the sites using scientific evidence to determine safety.、Hmm. Now, talking about safety, Abe was also asked about leaking radioactive water that wasn't disclosed for months.、Mm -hmm. uh, local residents and pro people from the fishing industry criticized the operator of the Fukushima Daiichi, that is, Tokyo Electric Power Company, for hiding the issue. Prime Minister Abe echoed that sentiment. He said it was regrettable that TEPCO did not reveal the problem to local people in the area. He said TEPCO needs to regain the trust of the people by communicating more information. He said that he demanded TEPCO to take additional measures to control the flow of the contaminated water. And he said that the government will take the lead in decommissioning of the nuclear power plant and managing the contaminated water. The head of a nuclear energy organization in Japan is calling for more transparency in the industry while pointing to the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Our industry had a closed nature before the accident. I think that unwillingness to acknowledge the issues and lack of an open, vigorous debate was a serious problem. Fujita spoke to reporters on the eve of the fourth anniversary of the accident. She said the group of nuclear researchers and experts want to ensure a disaster like the one at Fukushima never happens again. Last year, the society set up a committee to study the decommissioning of reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Members plan to make independent proposals on ways to decommission the plant and improve the safety of nuclear power generation. Tens of thousands of protesters rally against nuclear power outside Japan's parliament. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe hopes to restart Japan's nuclear industry soon, four years after it was halted by the Fukushima nuclear accident triggered by a massive earthquake and tsunami. The government is not committed to handling the situation in Fukushima. They keep hiding things and not sharing information with the public. The governmental support to the victims in Fukushima is not enough. It was the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl, contaminating water, food, and air, and forcing thousands to flee. Since then, Japan has had to import expensive fossil fuels to replace atomic power. Polls show that roughly two thirds of Japanese oppose relaunching their nuclear power plants. People in Japan are talk, taking time this week to look back on a day that caused so much hardship and heartache. The fourth anniversary of the March 11th earthquake and tsunami is on Wednesday. Business owners in one northeastern city know firsthand how tough it's been to rebuild. The sea swallowed their shops, and since then, they have had to move from place to place as the reconstruction effort progressed. And HK Wall's Mikiko Suzuki has the story. About 20 restaurant and shop owners operate in this temporary mall in Kesenuma's Shishiori District. Kenichi Shiota is one of them. His original restaurant and his house were swept away by the tsunami, and he doesn't yet feel established in his new noodle shop. It's been four years, but this is still the situation we're faced with. I would not call this revitalization; it's more like restoration. This is Shishiori three days after the disaster. The earthquake caused the ground to sink, and the tsunami swept away everything in its path. Shiota led efforts to open the first temporary shopping mall soon after the disaster. He organized fellow business owners from the district. At the time, this boat represented Shishiori. Many visitors traveled to see the 60-meter-long fishing vessel that was swept inland by the tsunami. But residents didn't want to be reminded of the disaster, so the boat was taken away in 2013, and the number of visitors decreased. Land elevation work has been carried out in this district since 2011. Last September, the temporary mall had to be moved ahead of the start of construction. The new location is far from homes and schools, so there are few customers. But Shiota and the other shop owners can't settle here either. 
they'll have to move yet again next year. We all want to run our shops here in our hometown. But we may have to choose between going out of business and leaving this town. Land elevation work begins with the removal of debris. Next, old water and gas pipes are taken out. Then, drains are put in to prevent liquefaction, and the ground level is raised by piling up dirt. Finally, new infrastructure is installed. The work is expected to take another three years. Keiichi Kato and his wife Katsuko are also facing an uncertain future. For more than 40 years, they ran a vegetable and flower shop, but they lost it in the disaster, along with their house. Now, there is no one to take over their business, and they can't borrow money from banks because of their age. I don't know how things will go in the future. I'm old, and I'm worried. Even if I'm asked to leave, I won't have anywhere else to go. Kato and his wife now live in temporary housing. They are torn between reality and their wish to rebuild their own shop after the ground elevation work is completed. I'm keeping myself busy with work and trying to ignore my worries. I just try to take each day as it comes. That's all I can do. Even after four years of anxiety, shop owners in Shishiori are still struggling to map out their future. Mikiko Suzuki, NHK World, Kesen Numa. The debate over a possible nuclear deal with Iran has reached a new level in Washington after a group of Republican senators signed an open letter to Tehran warning that any potential deal with President Obama could be scrapped. 47 senators have sealed the letter, stressing that international agreements need approval from Congress. They point out that President Obama will leave office in January 2017 and that any deal without congressional approval would be merely an executive agreement that could easily be revoked in the future. The Iranian government dismissed the letter as propaganda ploy, while the White House has blasted the move. I, I think it's somewhat ironic uh, to see uh, some members of Congress wanting to make common cause with the hardliners in Iran. Uh, it's an unusual coalition. 
this type of letter signed by uh, dozens of members of Congress uh, undermines uh, our efforts and what the uh, the ability of the commander in chief and the executive branches. I would describe this letter as uh, the continuation of a partisan strategy to undermine the president's ability to conduct foreign policy and advance our national security interests around the globe. The Republicans seem to have been inspired by the Israeli Prime Minister's passionate address to U.S. lawmakers, warning against any collaboration with Iran. Iran has proven time and again that it cannot be trusted. This regime will always be an enemy of America. In the meantime, an array of challenges lie ahead of the end of March deadline for Iran to agree cuts to its atomic program in exchange for lifting sanctions. The U.S. Secretary of State will meet his Iranian counterpart later this week for the next round of talks. Tom Hartman sought the Republicans' perspective on the negotiation process in RT's The Big Picture. This is the first time in the history of the Republic that an opposition party, for, politi for domestic political purposes, has, has participated. Can you imagine if, if, you know, when FDR was, was planning on uh, or was fighting Hitler in World War II, if, if some Republican, you know, why, you know, one of the guys who didn't want us to take on Hitler, the, there's a whole book full of them, um, uh, you know, in the, in the U.S. House and Senate, if they had open negotiate or if they had published an open letter to Adolf Hitler that said, you know, FDR might beat you, but just hang around, don't commit suicide, we'll make it all good. We're talking about a deal that will outlive the next possibly two or even three presidencies. So it's right and proper to point out that, that, any, that a subsequent president absolutely can overturn this. It's, it's incredibly important. Look, Tom, the bottom line is, it is it, Americans don't want this bill. 84% of Americans oppose this deal. Congress, for there all its no faults, deal. is still the people's body. There's a, there, there's, a, there's a negotiation on the table, and where it currently is, is totally out of step with where the American people want it to be. You don't know where it currently is. It's secret. 71. And it's not just oh, the United know, States. It's the United States know. plus five European countries. We know, we, 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 we know you guys are not just the disrespecting table, the United States. And what States, the American you're... people know, 71% of them, including almost 60% of Democrats, think that this deal will allow the Iranians to eventually have a nuclear bomb. That is the That's president's That's because they've been listening to bombast from people like you, which is not founded in reality. The Republicans' move appears to be rare, direct congressional interference in diplomatic negotiations. Foreign policy expert Robert Neyman believes the letter is more aimed at delivering a message within the U.S., rather than outside. They want to blow up the talks, and they're in a kind of panic because the belief is spreading that the U.S. and Iran and the other partners in the negotiation no are deal. close to a deal. So these moves are looking increasingly like grandstanding and, and like a cartoon a that's more about uh, the 2016 Republican presidential election, more for show like that, than actually directed at changing the outcome of the negotiations. 